Hi, I'm Coffee Kevin, and I'm here with a good friend of mine today, Rich Futrell of Vol Cafe. That's right. And uh, Rich and I have known each other for, wow, a long time. It's been a long time. Through and th through the counterculture days, back yes. around 2010 we met, and then That's right. you go back with counterculture all the way back to Fred back in the Fred. 90s. Fred Hauk. Yep. Wow. So when we were introduced, Brett told me, this guy's family, treat oh. him well. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. I, I I I have very happy memories of Fred. Fred was um, Fred, of course, had we're, we're written for Rolling Stone, and Fred was Fred was a great. You know, there's some people that are built the coffee industry in really more ways than uh, as as much as I value people who roast and people who who uh, you know taste great tasters of coffee. But Fred was Fred understood quintessential coffee enthusiast, and he was passionate about he that. He was. He taught a lot of people about coffee. Yeah. He was very humble and generous with all of his knowledge. Uh, just, a, just a great guy and a great character, and I, of course, appreciate both. Absolutely. And, and of great character. I mean, not, you know, a character meaning, you know, a character where character can be used a number of ways. Oh, what a character, you know, but it's, it's I meant it in the most positive way. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. And, of course, we've, we've yeah, you had uh, offices in the West Loop, and yeah. we used to go uh, hang out in Cup, and that's what you're here Today and and tell me what what's the difference? You were a buyer then, really. Yeah. Well, the, you know, when I worked for Counterculture, yeah. I was I did sales and support. Mm -hmm. So you know, we sold obviously Counterculture's roasted coffee, and you know, I opened the market in Chicago in 2011, and then sold Counterculture and supported our accounts throughout the Midwest. And then in 2016, I came aboard uh, with Counter with uh, Genuine Origin which is a Vol Cafe project. And so we're a web-based project and we sell green coffee in 65 pound boxes. And we're featuring coffees that are sourced through the Vol Cafe way, which is Vol Cafe's direct farmer support program. So Vol Cafe has hired and trained uh, about 250 field service officers that we loosely call ag agronomists. And some of them are technically agronomists. A lot of them are coffee farmers themselves. They all live in coffee farming communities in 13 different origin countries, and they're working hands-on with about 20,000 coffee farmers around the world every year. Wow. Um, it's a really great program, and they're working directly with coffee farmers with the goal of helping them run better businesses. They're, they're doing soil testing, uh, varieties testing, companion planting to help fix nitrogen and reduce um, the need for soil inputs, extra fertilizers. Um, a lot of pruning techniques, um, tree replacement techniques, just a very organized, a more organized way to approach coffee farming with the goal of increasing productivity and quality. So if you increase productivity, you're increasing pounds per acre or quintiles per hectare. And then increasing quality, you can increase the differential that you get for the coffee when you sell it. So the goal is to increase profitability at the farm level. So it's a fantastic program. I was intrigued enough by it to leave a great job at Counterculture, which I still love that company and I'm in touch with those guys. Um, but I've loved sort of telling the story of the Vol Cafe way and then, you know, having great coffees like these three that we have here to share with roasters. So it's um, so that's what Genuine Origin is. Vol Cafe, I always tell people that we've got these three terms, Vol Cafe, which is the parent company, Vol Cafe way, which is this direct farmer support program, and then Genuine Origin, which is the project that I work for, where we're web-based, uh, and we try to feature coffees through that we source through the Vol Cafe way, but we also have some coffees from other origins where we're not active on the ground, like Rwanda. Um, and, you know, it's 65-pound uh, boxes instead of 130-pound bags, like these here. So it's easy to, to carry around. We have no minimums, and um, it's just really easy way to order green coffee, and then we have reps like myself available to help consult with roasters. So that's the program, and we oh. have fantastic fresh coffees right now. This is that Christmas oh, for coffee. This See this time of year when you have all these great coffees coming in. Kenyans are coming. Costa Ricas are here and shipping. Great coffees from Guatemala, Honduras, Colombia. This is a great time of year for coffee. This, this is it. This yeah, this is, the, is you know one of those like times a of year. Fruit season. You know, you think about when the strawberries. I mean, cherries are good in the stores right now. Yeah, yeah. 
Is is it coffees like that well, too? From a, a number of different origins. From from but not, never it's never all of them at once, is right. it? Never all of them at once, but right now we're receiving coffees from a lot of different origins. I think, you know, right around February is when everybody's inventory gets pretty light and we're all waiting for coffees to come. And a lot of coffees are landing now. Let, let me stop you on that. I'm going to challenge it a little and ask, what is, is seasonality, is, is that caught on and is that, is that real, is, is, it, is it as real as it's made? Because I, I understand freshness as a consumer, sure. I understand freshness. If, if I buy it and I open the bag, yeah, I've got to use it up in a certain period of time. Sure. Green coffee is is that quite as sensitive to the to the you know yeah. like to, uh, ten days from the from the farm? Or is well, it, I'll tell you, it's tell a me. it's a new day for green coffee. This is a conversation I have with a lot of roasters right now. It is a new day for green coffee. We know a lot more about green coffee now than we used to. When I got involved in coffee in the '90s. You know, the, the idea was you really wanted to use the coffee. Well, let's go back to the 80s and 90s. Yeah. Initially, we would buy enough coffee to last year round. And so you'd have this blend, same components year round. By the 90s, we really got into this idea of seasonality. We got into this idea of freshness. And we got into this idea of coffee, green coffee will age and the flavors will drop off after, after a certain period of time. So in the mid 90s, before Grain Pro, the idea was you know, you got to get that coffee in as soon as you can and try to use it within six months because after about six months, it's going to drop off the table. It's going to be really flat. Um, okay. Now, what we've learned is there's been a lot more science. We were talking about things like WCR, World Coffee Research, and there's been a lot more science and research involved in coffee in the last 10, 15 years. And one of the things, there's a correlation between gentle processing and gentle drying and longevity of the coffee. So one thing we've seen is there's coffees from places like Kenya and Ethiopia that tend to last longer green. They tend to be dried slower. That's where the Kenya beds or the raised beds come from, this idea of slow drying. And also in Ethiopia, you have cloud forests, so it's not hot, direct sun. Um, there's a lot of conjecture about mechanical drying, potentially you know, by heating up the coffee, the green coffee doesn't last as long as far as the flavors. So there's particular attention paid to the way the coffee's processed, but also the way it's stored. You know, instead of just bringing in jute bags with no grain pro and storing it in a, a warehouse that's not climate controlled, you're gonna subject that green coffee to fluctuations in temperature and fluctuations in humidity. That can have an impact on water activity and an impact on the longevity of the green coffee because there's a lot of different compounds in that seed yeah. that contribute to flavor profile. So one of the things we've done at Genuine Origin is we're packing it in smaller amounts. We're packing it in Grain Pro and sealing it at origin. So this coffee, when it reaches the desired moisture level at origin, it gets put in a 65 pound Grain Pro and sealed. That's not unsealed until it's in your warehouse. So that's significant. So it's, it's sealed at origin, but also we have a climate controlled warehouse in Pennsylvania that we um, that we store the coffee in and so it's it's a food grade climate controlled warehouse so it's not you know big open warehouse that if it's a 95 degree day and it's super humid outside it's the same inside right so we're paying particular attention to the way it's stored and I've met some some roasters now that are doing an amazing job at building their own green rooms. I know a guy in Wisconsin, actually, I'll drop a name, JBC Coffee. J J I was just I was just up, I know who you're talking yeah. about, and I saw his climate controlled room, that's what I was thinking. Michael's brilliant, yeah. and he built this Michael. room, and he showed it to me, and I just said, Michael, I, if you don't mind, I wanna tell people about this, and he said, that's okay, you know. Uh, 65 degrees, 50% humidity year round, it's brilliant. He really cares, and he understands you know, when he purchases that coffee, he tries to bring it in because when he stores it, he knows the conditions he's gonna store it in. He doesn't necessarily know the conditions it's gonna be stored in in different warehouses around. And so, so, so in other words, if you, I mean, obviously, I hope they're doing better than this, but if you rent one of those storage lockers that, you know, you see the signs for first month free. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you're not, not, a, not an ideal place. I mean, a lot of roasters don't have a choice, you know, and there's also concern about, you know, if you're trucking your coffee, from the west coast to Chicago, and if you're trucking it over a weekend. I mean, there's roasters, again, Michael's very concerned about when he ships his coffee. He's like, I don't want it to ship over a weekend and sit in a hot truck right, somewhere in, a truck in somewhere. the sun. That could damage the coffee. Yeah. So 
So to get back to your question, we have a lot more knowledge and concern now than I think we did 20 years ago about the way that we treat green coffee and the effect that it has in cup quality. Any of your customers, I, uh, this is in uh, my video, Coffee Brewing Secrets. George Halt starts talking about freezing green. Yeah. Anyone doing that? Uh, you Other know, than George? <laughs> you know, George, yeah, George is, um, I think he was the first, you know, that, that I knew of. Um, I saw a presentation at um, RICO, a symposium in, in Seattle, I guess it was two years ago. Mm -hmm. It was probably 2017. And I can't remember the name of the person who did this presentation, but it was really enlightening because a lot of the criticism of that was carbon footprint and cost. You know, I mean, you, you, we've done, Counterculture did a great job of tracking carbon footprint of green coffee. Um, and shipping coffee, since those ships are so massive, is actually a very efficient way as far as carbon to ship coffee. A lot of the carbon footprint for green coffee is in the last mile, it's in the shop. Um, so there's a lot of concern about, you know, if you're putting it in cryogenic freezers, it costs money, it's electricity, or is that electricity coming from a coal burning fire, uh, coal burning plant? Um, but this presentation I saw at RICO, he really broke it down and made it sound as if it really wasn't that expensive in the long run and if it wasn't that much of a carbon footprint. I think it's an intriguing idea because how because it's intriguing but I, I have two schools of thought on this. Part of me I love the romance of coffee. I still you and I talk a lot. I love what I like to call factor X. Sometimes we get too scientific in terms of our you know all of our variables and oh, espresso <laughs> variables and things and sometimes I just say you know let's just call it factor X and and just enjoy it and let's sit in the moment and enjoy this amazing 30 seconds that we have to enjoy this shot of espresso um, so so there's a part of me that I like to play a game with my friends calling coffees I have known every once in a while on Facebook I throw it out there and it's yeah. fun because I remember a, a Kenya coffee from um, counterculture in 2006 called Kenya Gaki. And um, G Barger was our roaster at the time. A lot of people will remember G. He was a great roaster and it was an amazing coffee. I'd never had a coffee that tasted like this. And it was the first single origin espresso I ever had oh, from East like Africa. Ke and this Kenya? Is way back in 2006. Wow. And it was a funny story because I was in production at the time and I came in at five o'clock in the morning, pulled myself a shot, didn't know what was in there. And it was a palate scorcher. It just blew the top of my head off. I was like, what is this? And he said, oh, that's the Kenya Gaki. I was just playing with it. Now that's a very popular way yeah. to make espresso is, you know, very light, bright East African coffees pull this single origin espresso. Back then it was pretty unheard of. God, it's got to be done just right. It's got to be done just right. I've it had, can be super I've sour. Had, I've had, yeah. you know, I, yeah, I know. I had a very memorable on the other way with that. But yeah. Yes, I've had the good one. So, but as far as freezing coffee, there's there's a romance of you know that I love of saying, well, remember that coffee? It was wonderful, and let's talk about the taste, and we'll never have that coffee again. But with this idea of freezing coffee, the idea is, you know, you can go back and pull that 2006 Kenyagaki out that's of deep what, that's freeze what George said. and sit down and taste yeah. it side by side. Right. Um, you know, I think that's an interesting idea. Well, obviously, um, the wine business understands the, sure. the you know, the the, uh, the Bordeaux that's you know been you know that your you know father-in-law finally brings you. You've proven yourself a valued member <laughs> of the family, you know, and, and then he trips and drops it. But or it's no, corked, it's, and you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, well, I've had that bottle. <laughs> I've but, had plenty of those. Yeah, too. I know. The uh, <laughs> saved for a long time for a special occasion. <laughs> nope. But. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> now is the time. But but yeah yeah no, you make a great point. Uh, on the other hand, I think we're. Uh... It's interesting. I don't know if it's necessary. I guess you know I love this idea of se of seasonality of coffee too. Mm -hmm. Like let's see what else is coming. It's you know we're always working on improving. We're always working on improving processing. We're testing varieties. We're discovering old varieties and new varieties. I mean, um, but I I do at the end of the day I think. It's an interesting idea. Um, I don't know how um, scalable it is, to be honest, but we'll see. I mean, we'll see. It's obviously out there and people are experimenting with it. It, it is, and the idea of uh, preserving coffee uh, from, a, from a consumer point of view, and, and I'm thinking home roasters too for the freezing. Sure. I mean, I'm sure the freezing green is, and, and small batch 
roasters. Yeah. I, I, I don't. Th I, I think it's kind of a cool idea that a roaster could bring out something for, let's say, a holiday blend, and say, "Well, these are this this or or a holiday treat." Yeah. This is a little bit of that. Uh, uh, let's uh, move away from Kenya for a second. 2007 let's, uh, this geisha. Is, this is yeah. a geisha that yeah we had, <laughs> and and as George even said the year yeah the 2007 geisha, and right. I've had it in storage. Epic, right? Yeah. Well, and, I mean, you read about that coffee, yeah. and it's and it's been immortalized. Um, we all know the coffee, so pretty amazing. I mean, imagine if that went up for auction now. I mean, it went for a lot back then. So. I I think from a consumer point of view, you want to be able to sell her long-term coffees. Mm -hmm. they, uh, no one thinks in the wine business, we have to have this one wine, no matter what we're having with dinner, we have to have this one wine because frankly, it's, I've only got, you know, a couple of days and it's going to go, it's going to be gone forever. I'm not, yeah. I'm not talking about green now, I've switched to roasted, but you know, it's, it, it, to me, it is nothing wrong or unusual or unromantic about being able to pull out something and save it and, f and find a way to stop the process or at least slow it so dramatically that we can you can do a comparison and and, sure. and we can we can you finally have a seller that's why i'm a big believer in the coffee freshness system because the guy has a, an invention where i've got these canisters and I've, I've collected enough of them now that i could actually give you a coffee that's uh up you know a year old Oh yeah, and and it's roasted a year ago, and it will still foam up in every way that I found that I can analyze. It's the same coffee, and I think the idea of being able to do that is long term, really good because people put a lot into branding and a lot into building these sure. coffees and, and getting that review at the coffee review, and all of a sudden it's like, poof, no more. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, I, I'm a romantic at heart, and I have a lot of romantic ideas about coffee, so there's part of me that likes that, too. There's part of me that likes that fleeting, zen sort of idea yeah. of, you know, the, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's produce, it's a product, it comes, we enjoy it, it's temporal in nature, we share it, and then we remember it, and then, well, and then we look forward to I it again it. next I year. So there's, there's a yeah. part of me that loves that, you know, and I, I will always love that about coffee. I, and, it, and, and I would say yours, that vision's winning right now yeah. because that's the way, I mean, the seasonality, it got to, it's, it really is. And it's, it's uh, I was, uh, in fact, I was just talking to uh, Todd Goldsworthy at, at Clatch down at uh, Coffee Fest and, and, and I, you know, begged him to send me a little bit of that, uh, their $70 a cup, $75, he corrected me. <laughs> so I, I heard his phone buzz, his mic, you know, <laughs> 75, <laughs> three exclamation points. And I'm like, you know, is it really worth it? I was kind of making fun of them that, yeah, come on, you know, it's not worth it. You know, is it really, 75, is it really that? Anyway, we're building up my taste buds are wetting. I'm ready to do everything <laughs> to, to get a cup of this coffee. And he says, well, I'd love to give you one. Seriously, Kevin, but we're out of it. <laughs> so, well, they got That's their, their yeah. PR out of it. And of course, yes, I get there's another one right around the corner, hopefully. Sure. But that is a, uh, anyway, let's, you brought some killer coffees. And now we're talking about coffee so much, I'm starting to get really, really Yeah, thirsty. you want to brew some coffee? Yeah, and let's, uh, Michael, is there a way to see uh, these coffees that I can... Uh, well, we've, you know, I've I brought three from Costa Rica. These all... Um, these are all three from Costa Rica? Costa Rica, coffees. 2019 oh. Harvest. They all started shipping yesterday. So this is very timely. This was a oh. spontaneous event with Kevin this morning. Um, didn't really plan it, so I'm glad we're doing it, but I had these coffees, and so I roasted them real quick, and they started shipping yesterday. Um, we have, they're all from Terrazu, um, or Terrazu. There's a lot of ways to say that. So the uh, first one is Costa Rica San Diego Honey. And Terrazu, the region, is the is yes. part of Costa Rica, right. and it has a certain... Yes, yeah, it's one of the more, it's one of the more climate. popular regions in Costa Rica, yeah. Soil. Yep, climate, soil. Practices. Um, practices, elevation, and all of our coffees have a lot of information on the website. I was going to kind of pull it up here so I could read everything from the elevation. I know a lot about these, but I don't know everything, every single detail. Um, however, I brought these three because they're all from Terrazu, they're all from Costa Rica, they're all from the same harvest, but they're all dramatically different. So we have a honey wow. process from our mill called the San Diego Mill. 
which I've been to. It's from it's an oldest mill in Sandy from in Costa Rica. It was built in 1888, but it's also the most high tech. So it's an, an incredible juxtaposition of old and new. You go there and you see some of the old milling equipment that's beautiful and it's on display. But they also have a massive biodigester that they power the plant on. I believe it's a carbon neutral plant and it's this massive thing. I said, what is that? Oh, that's our biodigester. You know, we put everything in there from, you know, pulp and leaves and, you know, branches and twigs and it, you know, we have lots of bacteria and it digests and they generate electricity for this mill. And wow. it's a massive mill. Yeah. Um, and they have everything from patio drying, raised bed drying, they do honeys, they do black honeys. Um, they do all kinds of great processing there. So this is from that mill, and the coffee is from a, a collection of producers in Terrazzo. Um, and then we have this two single farm lots. One of them is Luis Eduardo Campos. Um, and this is interesting because this is anaerobic processing. Um, and the name of his farm is Cordillera del Fuego. And what they do with this is, you know, typically after you... Um, you um, take off the, um, I'm sorry, that you send it through the pulper. I was thinking in Spanish for a second, which is a good sign because I'm trying to speak more Spanish, but I'm not great at it. So you, do, you, you pulp the coffee and then you have all the mucilage still attached to the seed. Typically, you put it in a big vat and you ferment it. Depending on the region, the elevation, the, you know, all the different, sometimes it's, it's fermented for 12 hours. I've even heard up to 72 hours in places in Kenya. Um, what they do wow. here, instead of having that open fermentation, they put it in a stainless steel container and they seal it up. So it's anaerobic, lack of oxygen. Um, but then, so then you have a lot of different processes that happen that are unique. Like there's an increase in lactic acid and malic acid. Um, there's an increase in CO2, which creates pressure. So it's done in the absence of oxygen with increased pressure and different acids are increased. So you create this very unique flavor profile. Wow. And the third one is a single farm lot from Humberto Naranjo Portugues, um, also processed at the same mill at the uh, Beneficio San Diego. And this is a single farm, single variety. So this is 100% Costa Rica or 100% yellow Catuai. Okay. Um, so this one is 100% Katura with special processing and aerobic. This is 100% yellow Katuai. And um, so yeah, so these are three different ones. And I'm really excited about these coffees because um, they all have very unique flavor profiles, which I think one thing about Costa Rica, it's an amazing place. Um, you know, they have a minimum payment um, to pickers, which I think is really a wonderful thing. So minimum wage for pickers in Costa Rica. They also have a rural... Is that unusual? Um, I, I hear, I think Uganda might as well. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, pickers are the forgotten people in coffee. Um, you know, we talk a lot about payment to farmers and how much farmers make, but you know, there's a lot of farmers that hire pickers who a lot of them are migrants. And so they're people who are the lowest on the totem pole. And so a lot of times we don't realize that you know, these are the people who are out in the fields picking the coffee, making day day wages. I, so. I have one time picked coffee when we did Mission Coffee Can in uh, Guatemala. I I picked coffee for probably ten minutes. Let me tell you, yeah, it uh, anything like that just to do it once, and I realized that uh, <laughs> I'm hardly uh, that doesn't qualify me to even testify more than just a comment, quick comment it, is that. It's all, it's 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 real work, and uh, I find, I know ten minutes. It's not you, you, the people. I'm sure going to make f uh, light of this, but you know, I was really tired. I mean, it's a, to, to actually focus and do it for ten minutes, and yeah, and <laughs> it's it's not easy work. It's not easy work. Families, I saw women doing it with the children, you yeah. know, with them, and and uh, it was. I, I understand that there's two sides to that too, you know, yeah. but. We keep the family together. That's good, but you know, it's there's all sorts of ethics involved, in oh, yeah. it, and and that's a whole different uh, subject. Absolutely, yeah. So it's great to hear that you know there's you know a place like Costa Rica, it's a carbon neutral country. Yeah, um, they're they're doing really good things. But the coffee tends to be more expensive 
as a result of some of these measures they put into place because sure. they have percentage of FOB has to go to farm gate. So they have some controls to make sure farmers are taken care of, pickers are taken care of. But they also have a really highly developed uh, system, you know, to get the coffee from the farms to the mills and really great sorting. So what you end up with a lot of times from Costa Rica is sort of homogeneously good coffee. And one of the things we realize is a lot of our customers want a lot of more variety and tastes. And so one of the things that's great about Costa Rica is they, you know, they invented the honey process. Um, they've perfected it in a lot of ways and they have a lot of different types of experimental processing. So we're bringing in coffees that have experimental processing, uh, single variety or single um, varieties because we want to be able to present instead of presenting 20 different coffees from Costa Rica that are all homogeneously good we want to present four or five from Costa Rica that all are very unique flavors because um, that makes it fun you know fun with flavors that's a lot of a lot of times when you boil down what we do it's fun with flavors you know it's great to taste and then it's great to kind of dig in and find out what is it that makes the coffee taste like that um, and so I think we're, we're in a fun time in, in the coffee industry in the world of coffee we're learning more about what contributes to the flavor profile in the cup and it sounds like these coffees are all uh, so it, it, an interesting thing for me is going to be instead of tasting different regions because it's real easy to think in terms of almost uh, ethnicity of coffee, yeah. instead of doing it that way, these are all coffees that come from the same region, and the, we're, we're really going to taste processing differences. Processing, and, but also this is 100% Katura, this is 100% oh, different Katuai, uh, heirloom Katuai, variety. different varieties, yeah. different processing. Um, these two come from the same mill, so so we're kind of mixing all that up here, yeah. I mean, there's. There's regional differences, um, but there's also, you know, you go to places and, um, you know, in Costa Rica, again, they have good roads, they have good infrastructure, it's a small country. The coffee tends to be picked on the farm level and then at that day taken to a collection area where then it's put into trucks and then trucked right to the mill and then it's got, you know, processing on a large scale. In other places I've been, like Nicaragua doesn't have as a developed an infrastructure. There's a lot of processing on the farm. You know, coffee is ah, picked okay. at, picked on the farm, and then right there on the farm they have their own pulpers. A lot of times they're handmade. I've seen them where they're powered by bikes. <laughs> I saw one that was powered by a river, which is amazing, and a, a farm called Finca Esperanza Verde in Nicaragua, where they took PVC pipes from a, a river, a mountain river. And they took the you know kinetic energy, or I guess it was the potential energy from the river, piped it down to this mill, created a little turn wheel, and then the water spun it, and then it ran the pulper, and then they took the water and delivered it right back into the river. So they just took a little bit of energy out of that water and put it right back into the river. So, what order do you want to cut? I think these let's do it this way. Um, okay, so left to right. Yeah, for us. And I, for the I audience. I am going to... And then, yeah. Yeah, let's just do it this way. That's good. Okay. So and let's the, start with the San Diego honey. One. And I've got... I, I was able to dig out two of the pint Chemexes. I know I, I have more, but, you know, it's finding things here. Is, I'll leave it to my wife to fill you in later on that um, in the audience. Uh, but that's 28 grams making it with Chemex, and I'm using a drip grind... So pretty close to, I think, how people would get to taste it at home. Great. Uh, not so much, and I'm matching a little bit of the cupping experience by using a lower brew temperature around 197. Okay. So it'll be a little more like have that French press cupping thing, although it'll be totally clean because of the, of the Chemex filter paper. And then here we are, I'm trying to get the... A little bloom there. Yeah, a little bloom. And, but wow, you could tell you roasted this yesterday. Yeah, because it's pretty of the lively. bloom is quite, yeah, quite good. Um, it's. Uh, yeah, I, I have an Ikawa sample roaster at home. How how do you like that thing? I've seen it at the at the shows, and it's like, is it a consumer unit or not really? I have the pro model, yeah. and they they do have two models, and. Yeah. I love it, and you know, I almost call it um, an assessment tool, 
versus yeah. a sample roaster because yeah. I do 50 gram batches and you know like our samples bags like this is a sample bag and and our sample bags are 300 grams so you know I've I talked to lots of different roasters around the country uh, with all kinds of sizes of operations from people who are just getting started out to people roasting a million plus pounds a year and you know different people have different size sample roasters the, the nice thing about an Ikawa is you can literally take a two or three hundred gram sample you can have three or four different profiles that you've established that you like sometimes you, know, you can have profiles based on coffee density um, I sort of have a standard cupping profile that I use for everyone but what you can do is to really explore coffee you can within an hour roast four or five batches of the same coffee on four or five different profiles and then you can taste them all side by side. Oh, that's pretty good dramatically, fast and efficient. So if you really want, and you can do that with just this small amount of coffee. Oh, that's nice too that you can So you it's know. efficient, it's not wasteful. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of customers who only have maybe a five kilo roaster and they don't have a sample roaster. Right. So in order to get a sample, they need to do at least a pound or more. Um, which can be hard, you know, because then it's one shot. You throw it in there yeah, and... Yeah, using all your coffee for the one sample, and it's, you know, what if you're off a little, too, you know? It's, yeah. It's, <laughs> so this way you can do four or five in a row, and you can taste them all side by side and really see what's in that coffee and help you dial in, and then help you dial in that coffee in the, the roast profile. So. Man, this is... Uh, and if you... If, uh, those of you... Do, Home roasting is pretty easy to get into. I mean, it's you know you get a. I, I started I think with a corn popper. Oh yeah. You know, we that, all. <laughs> it's uh, I. It's probably the the most widely used um, home roaster. I mean, I actually know I have some roasting friends who still use corn poppers uh, as sample roasters. I know. They started off using those, and you know it's so, sort of like a known entity. You get good at it, and you you know you, it's uh, they don't have a, a cool cycle, but. You, you know, there are other ways to deal with it, and uh, I, I uh, can tell you, uh, who was it? West Bend actually considered bringing out a home roaster. A home roaster, really? And <laughs> they, so many they of their poppers it. were. Uh, I being saw it. Used. That's great. I held it in my hands. I brought it to uh, uh, housewares and uh, the International Housewares Show one year, and I, they did, never brought it out. I think uh, the follow-up was they had done their suits, you know, had done the uh, analysis of the insurance liability and they decided to stick to oh. corn popping. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, uh, it is essentially the same process. And did a good job. I have a civets, little civets hand roaster. Oh yeah. And uh, that uh, Mike civets signed and it was, uh, it works great. I, great. It's, it's great. It's not, yeah, it's a rarity. I should, probably shouldn't use it because someone told me once you're Signature is going to wear off, but <laughs> I can't help it. I still use it. I see the Quest M3 out there a lot. Yeah. A lot of people use those as sample roasters. Um, of course, you know the ProBot barrel roasters are very popular. Yeah. I wouldn't mind getting one of those. Once why you see, I figured you you probably had uh, Jeb as Burns at your house. No, you yeah, I, you know the Kawa is <laughs> nice too because it comes in a Pelican case and I can take it on the road. So oh, you can. Oh, it's really designed to travel around. That's I've done that cool. with a lot of my. You know, when I get on the road and maybe do a big week visiting roasters, I'll just bring it with me. And sometimes it's, I'll bring that. I'll bring green coffee. I'll bring some that I've roasted and. It's nice to be able to get in a conversation with someone and they say, oh yeah, I'd be interested in trying that and just say, well, let's just grab my roaster and roast a batch. And in 10 minutes, you know, there we have it. So it's kind of a nice nice way to be able to have it all right there with me. It's it's a, uh, you, you, you haven't lived though until you've tried to explain to TSA at the airport what <laughs> your civets roaster is yeah. doing in your luggage. Yeah. And what is this, sir? <laughs> well, <laughs> Where should I start? You know, yeah, should exactly. I, am, I, am I safer just to make something up and not yeah, go there? <laughs> with a heating element and electronics, you got to be careful with that. That's I, for sure. I always got all kinds of junk that's hard to explain, but um, it's, uh, there we go, we're getting close. Uh, but it's really a, uh, a really, it is fun to sample roast. It's, it's um, and sample roasting, of course, is, is great because you can do the same thing we're doing. There's no reason someone couldn't do this on the weekend with some friends. Oh, sure. Make yeah. some coffees. And 
and try it. And it's, oh, there's also kind of a, a from scratch element to it that is undeniable. Oh yeah. And and I I have said this before. Uh, anyone who's a regular viewer knows I have admitted this. I'm a horrible home roaster. I am like the worst. I because I get a phone call from my brother calls me in the middle and I'm like, you know, I, I, I say, well, I'm going to be, I'm going to tell him I'll call him back. And I get, he gets, he finds a way to involve me, yeah. you know, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, usually some controversy in our family. And, uh, uh oh yeah. He said, what? <laughs> so, uh, we, uh, but you can, I can lose track and I, I can tell you, I know how Starbucks was invented. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the nice thing about the Ikawa is it's sort of a set it and forget it type of thing because it's Bluetooth with an app on your phone. And so you literally... Oh, does it automatically start the cooling yeah. cycle? Oh, yeah. Does it monitor yeah. the, I mean, the doneness and everything? Too? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. So, you, I mean, you have an app on your phone and then you have all your profiles on the phone wow. and then you send it to the roaster from your phone. So these are all the different profiles that you can see. And that's my washed baseline profile that I eat, my typical profile. But then there's, um, you know, all these different profiles that we've created over the years. Uh, Kenya wash profile, you can see it's pretty, starts pretty Man. hot. It's can pretty can fast we get a warm. shot of this, Mike? Is there a way to, uh, can, can you hold it right down here? That'll show it up to this camera. See the camera up there? Oh, right. You just, just, just hold it uh, oh, wow. toward, yeah, there you go. Can we get the overhead shot? Are we hooked up? No. No. Okay. Well, okay. what? What? Uh, I'm not gonna. Uh, how, yeah. How about that? How about that? How about the camera that goes to me? Thank you. It's just worth seeing this one thing, and then we'll. I promise we'll. <laughs> so yeah, this is. And the profile, and so you can see up there. It says "Looking can, for Can you can you so see it, Mike, or is it is it? Uh, it looks like your screen went off, or is it us? Oh no, no, that's the light. The light's the light. catching it. Tilt it down a little. Oh, he's oh, fine there tilting. We, there we go. There, that did it. All right, there you go. That looks great. Wow, look at that. So you can see, and then you can show the rate of rise oh, on there fantastic. as well, and. There's lots of different profiles that you can, so it's it's a nice way to really get insights into your roast. And then the nice thing, I've got customers who have an Ikawa, and we will just um, send each other, you can text each other profiles. So, you know, somebody orders a sample from our website, they call me and say, hey, I got a sample of this, what do you recommend? And I say, well, I've been using this one. I text them my profile. Um, so it's... It's it's very handy using modern technology. That's right. You, you can know. just you can you could actually send it to somebody. Let's say you were selling some of this coffee to a roaster, or, and, and you could and they said, "Wow, I really like the way yours came out." Yeah. And you you can send them how you did it. Yeah. Just and text it right over. Wow. Yeah. So I've sent roasted samples Incredible. to customers, and then they said, "I really liked it, but I'm not getting it." You know that the a same. I'm not getting the same flavors out of it. And I say, well, here's the insights I can send you. This is what I did with that batch that I sent you. Um, so, and my, my coworkers and I will also share uh, Rose Profiles quite a bit. That is a good, so really sometimes you've had input from someone else who says, when you, when you, when you show it to somebody, take, yeah, I can't wait to try this. Uh, send it to them and let them let them try it this way. Let yeah. Them, yeah. Oh, wow. That is incredible. That's really. Thank you, sir. You are welcome. Wow. All right. Costa Rica, San Diego, honey. Thank you. Oh, this is delicious. Not too much. No. All right. Wow. Are we, uh, are we going to get to, Mike, can you get to, oh, this is until we get the smell option, the app. <laughs> <laughs> this is you know I I I I we do need smell a vision don't every we? day. You know, yeah, I don't mean to. So sweet. Mm. This is frankly quite delicious. This is now. Are we? Yeah, that's why I didn't know if we should taste them in or some sort of order, like to build up, or. But you're not yep. that manipulative. Well, I mean, you know, we 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 could. But um, 
I mean, this the the anaerobic is sort of the <laughs> it's the wild one. I mean, so the anaerobic actually has sold out completely in pre-sale. Oh wow! We sold this last year for the first time, Going and up. it was wildly popular. It's it's incredibly unique flavor profile. Um, my friend Lem Butler over at Black and White Coffee. I worked with him at um, Counterculture for a long time, and they bought a bunch. Um, and um, so this one is very unique. Now that what we're tasting now, the San Diego honey, I've had a lot of different honey process coffees, and what I love about this one is it's so incredibly clean, and it's sweet. It's just very sweet. You know, I get nice apricot. There's, and it's fresh. I mean, the, this is this is where this you is talk about freshness coffee. too, because wow. when you get really good fresh green coffee, you end up with like layers and layers of flavor when it's again when it's processed well and sorted well and roasted well and stored well and brewed well and you realize you know I mean, that's the amazing thing about coffee is you have just so many processes and nobody's really adding quality to the coffee this is a speech i used to give to baristas you know we're all doing our best to preserve the quality that's inherent in that coffee all the way from the beginning of when you choose to pick it when it's you know, chosen because when you when you're picking coffee, you're not just going through and picking all the coffee. You're looking at only picking the ripe ones. You want it at the peak of right. You know, <laughs> I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at the. I used to work with an editor, a tape editor, and yeah. I, I was a producer, and he, she'd always tell me, "Oh, I pulled you out of the fire again, Kev." <laughs> <laughs> I knew what she meant. It was like what she meant is she's fixing everything that we did and. Mm -hmm. Production, you know. <laughs> and she's trying to make it make it make sense, right? <laughs> like she sounded like if she had a Scottish, it sounded like Mr. Scott on the Star Trek show. I'm doing the best I can, Captain. <laughs> doing the best I can, Captain. <laughs> the Dilithium <Yeah>. crystals. <laughs> but she was Karen. But she was a great editor, and she she was really good. Sometimes I'd have to kind of bite my tongue because, you know, well, I did think we gave you okay footage, yep. Karen, and. The actors will be happy to know that you were able to make them seem plausible. <laughs> it's just funny how you're right, though. We are all really trying to preserve. Yeah, in, I the, I in the, the supply chain, you know, in the supply chain, it's everybody's responsibility to try to preserve the inherent quality that's in that coffee. And you know, a lot of people, you know, might lead you to believe that they're adding quality by roasting it well or by brewing it well, and. Um, right. By doing good roasting, you're honoring the, the, the coffee and you're honoring the flavors that are in there and trying to help, e help them emerge through proper application of heat and time. And that's the same thing with brewing, you know, through proper application of good water, heat and time, you're trying to extract the inherent quality that's in the coffee. And so I still, after all these years of doing this, I still marvel at a good cup of coffee. Um, that's what keeps me working in this industry. It's still a little bit of a miracle every day. It's kind of amazing. It is, and, and I, I must say too, that what about the, um, and I understand you're, you're, a, you're certainly proficient as a roaster, but I, I'm not asking you as a, someone who's a Michael at, at JBC. I, sure. I, I'm, I'm saying though, you're, this is roasted yesterday. Right. I know there's a, at least an, uh, a prevalent urban myth in the coffee industry that coffee has to rest for at least 24 hours afterwards. I understand we didn't have that kind of sure. time anyway, but the point is, I'm not, I'm not getting. Uh, what would I get if I waited about with this? Well, um, so it's interesting because SCA cupping protocol is to cup within 24 hours of roasting. Yeah. I personally, my personal preference is three to four days off of roast. I really love There's roasting. A sweet spot, isn't there? there is a sweet yeah. spot, and I like roasting enough so that I can start tasting at three and go even up to two weeks if possible. I did a fun experiment with a coffee with a friend of mine who works at Metropolis, actually, Chris. Um, oh, I know. Chris. He gave me some coffee from Yemen, and, and we both try to do this staggered tasting. And it's hard to do because you got to be organized and do it every day. And just to see how coffees develop after they've been roasted and for how long. Um, but my sweet spot generally is three to four days off of roast. Six to seven, it can be great for a pour over. Yeah. For espresso, I like 14 days off roast. 14 I days do. off roast. Yeah, I do. Seven to 14. It helps, uh, helps mellow that uh, 
I think it's, if if I'm doing production work at a bar, I yeah. like a co I like an espresso. Definitely no younger than seven days, but I, I look at 14 days as a really workable product. You know, you can work with it, you can dial it in. It's a little more forgiving. It has a bigger window of acceptable flavors. Um, you know, when the espresso is too lively, it can just get away from you, and it's hard to dial in. Wow, that is interesting. It's 14 days off. See, but this is, you're right, this is really fresh roasted. I yeah. think you're going to see a lot, you're going to see um, a lot more clarity um, and more layers of fruit. That's one thing that I love about this coffee in particular, uh, if, you, if you gave it a few more days. It is, it is, having said that. And there's now, a little bit left here, so you thank you. hold on to well, this. I'm going to make this your weekend coffee. Thank you, I will. The uh, uh, now I have to, and that'll be right. It'll hit the sweet spot mm. actually for me. Um, although also uh, as it cools, right now. yeah. Not to interrupt. I know. Sorry. You know, it's okay. <laughs> it's, 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 believe me, it's okay. You're the guest. You're <laughs> well, I, I'm getting excited because yeah. as it cools, um, and a lot of flavors will emerge as well. Um, and I have a. I love cupping coffees. I have a customer in Milwaukee, some really great people at Anodyne Coffee, and my friend Steven at Anodyne, he said to me that he always cups coffees and he cups them all the way to room temperature. And his reason, which made so much sense to me, and I, and I told him, I said, I'm gonna tell everybody this and give you credit. He said, you know, I want to taste my, he's like, when my customers get a cup of coffee at our shops, their last impression of the coffee is going to be a room temperature swig. Yeah, that's true. And he said, I just want to know what their final impression of that coffee is going to be before they walk out the door. And I was like, Stephen, man, that's beautiful. I said, I'm going to tell everybody that and I'm going to give you credit. And so he's, he literally will cup into room temperature for that reason, which I think is great. And I cup to room temperature because you'll see lots of flavors emerge and dissipate yeah. to room temperature. And honestly, Kenyan coffees, which exciting, Kenyan coffees are afloat, they're landing, a lot of them are landing, ours will be here soon. I prefer Kenyan coffees room temperature because I, there, there's just so much going on I, I, in I, Kenya's that you see an incredible amount of variation in different Kenyan micro lots from like blackberry to green tomato to tomato vine to you know, all kinds of flavors in those coffees. It's just incredible. Lots of savory, lots of umami, soy sauce. I mean, all kinds of good things. I'll be um, uh, the same, I'm the same way. I actually like coffee colder than most people. I, I say this all the time. I, I really like coffees as they cool. And if it's, especially if it's a good coffee, it's, if it's not, if it, I will say this. Oh, the uh, flaws come forth, let's, uh, the flaws come forth from coffee as they cool too. Yep. So there's a there's a certain uh, <laughs> hot coffee is the uh, is the friend of. Uh <laughs> <laughs> you're right. No, you're right. And uh, you know oh, what I noticed man. too. Sorry. Yeah. That's. Just, that's uh <laughs> I knew that would happen. <laughs> I feel like we're back in college again. This is. <laughs> Let's not go there. All right. So uh, that's the anaerobic. <laughs> <laughs> what did you get in that in that whiff there? Wow, man, I, I right? don't know, but it, man, whatever it is, it's like, oh, my gosh, this is the wild, wild one, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, this is the anaerobic. Man, it's good wild. I mean, it's, it's uh, now, let me uh, do my yeah. job here. I mean, this, this one, it, this is the only coffee that I've sold. When people get green samples of it, I get phone calls. Um, Oh, tell me. Oh, okay. Wow, that's even an unusual green right. coffee smell. I mean, you can really smell naturals when they're green, um, <laughs> but this one. So I, I should give Lem some credit. Where on the third wave roast chart does this fall? <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen that chart. <laughs> I have a bunch on my wall at home, I, but I've never I, uh, seen that I, one. I posted a blog article <laughs> once and said, "Is this coffee or sushi?" On the Roaster called me up. <laughs> so yeah, the aromatics on this are just, uh, I, when I talk about this coffee, I just say it's, it's bonkers um, and, and all in a good way. It's 
This is why I say to people, this is a really exciting time to be in coffee because there's it more is. science is being applied to coffee through like UC Davis that we talked about right. earlier right. and WCR, World Coffee Research. Wine has always had all this great research because wine is a product that's come out of the West. You know, it's come out of the Mediterranean and coffee has been a product that we've created as a commodity out of the developing world and sold as a commodity. So finally, there's institutions putting more um, science behind this. And we're actually going to visit a college this afternoon, aren't we? Yes, we are. We're going to North Central. Which is exciting yeah. that we have right here in the Chicago area, there's going to be a college. Uh, that has a lab. Yeah. That uh, That is. Excited <laughs> to meet Dr. Thalman and check out what they've got going on. Four traffic lights from my house, too. <laughs> Man, now Pat knows where to look for me. <laughs> uh, oh, you're over there, Professor Thalman again. <laughs> <laughs> So I think I think what we're going to see this is a harbinger of what we will see in the future in coffee. I think we're we're seeing more flavors coming in to a cup of coffee that we haven't seen before. And by that I don't mean flavors from flavored coffee or barrel aged or anything like that. I'm saying naturally occurring flavors that we're going to see as a result of varieties, processing, um, and things like this, like anaerobic processing, where you're really working with the natural processes of productions of gases and, and acids and pressure, and then the result is new flavors that we haven't tasted before in a cup of coffee. Is there, are, you know, is this gets to another thing. Uh, you know, I've heard some, I'll call them uh, hysterical uh, articles and, and comments from people that are in our, the industry. That, that say, oh, the great coffees are, you can't get coffees like that anymore. And, and it's uh, impossible for, due to climate change, it's impossible for farmers to always, the climate's always changing. And is, is, is that where, where, where I, I understand, and yeah. you're not, where, where do you guys? Yeah, I mean, well, it's, you know, it? it's, it is definitely true that um, there's lots of challenges happening in agriculture around the world as a result of climate change. Undeniable, absolutely undeniable. Um, and, you know, coffee is, is a product that's grown at elevation. And as climate changes, you're seeing pests and diseases move up the mountain. Um, everything also, not just in coffee. I mean, malaria is being seen in mountain communities where it's never been seen before um, because there's mosquitoes that are able to survive up at elevation where they couldn't before. So it's, it's not just coffee. It's, we're seeing this all over the place. Animals, organisms, diseases, yes. pests are emerging in places where they never have before. And then you have life forms, organisms, plants that have not developed natural defenses against these pests and diseases that are under attack. And so, you know, WCR is doing great, great research um, right now, trying to meet those challenges. Now, the truth is, too, there's more coffee being produced in the world now than there ever has been before. So, um, and you hear this about bananas too. I'm reading more articles about the threat of bananas um, and the current, you know, variety that we're all eating of banana. Um, so, so I think you know we're not going to be without coffee tomorrow. We're also seeing new origins emerging. China is growing a lot of coffee for the first time. You know, I started to see China over the last several years having bigger and bigger booths in. SEA mm -hmm. at the conference, you know, so they're producing more coffee. They're also consuming more coffee. So there's there's a lot of interesting trends happening in the world right now. Um, and clearly it's affecting the price of coffee. There's consumption is going up in places where consumption, you know, was either non-existent or very low before, like China and India. Production is also going up in certain places, but production is also being really hammered in certain places. Um, there are cycles of production as well. Costa Rica had a banner year a couple years ago. This year, productivity was low. So while the sea market prices are low, prices from Costa Rica are really high right now, and Sumatra, because they, they, their production was very low. So there's, there's a lot of forces at play. And so I think a lot of times we like to simplify things um, and either say, oh, climate change, we're not going to have coffee tomorrow. It's like, well, that's not true. I mean, we're, we're producing tons of coffee right now. And a little too much because it's driving prices down, so that hurts farmers. But there's a lot of forces. I mean, there's 
populations are moving into urban areas and away from agriculture. I mean, you and I are right. a bit older. Um, our parents' generation, there's a lot of people growing up on farms. Um, you don't hear that much anymore in America. That's uh, um, the, one of the proudest c comments I usually meet when I meet a coffee farmer is, they proudly tell me their daughter's becoming a doctor and right. their son's still going into another business. They're both moving to the city. And you yeah. can't blame them. You know, no, let, know. let's be open and let's be honest. But, the, you know, there's a, there's a huge challenge right now with, with the children of coffee farmers leaving the farm and not coming back. Um, I, you know, we did a, when I started at Genuine Origin, we, we had really great training on all the origins where we have exporting com companies and our coworkers are running Volcafe Way. And we were told, I think the average age for a farmer in Guatemala at the time, this was three years ago, is 46. Um, the average age for a farmer in, which is also kind of old, you know, if you think of the, the life expectancy in Guatemala. We were told the average age of a farmer in Kenya is 64, which is shocking, wow. you know. Yeah. So people are <laughs> I, I moving know personal to the cities. experience how old that is. Yeah, the, right. uh, is uh, and <laughs> but that's that's a shocking, you know, like if you again, if you look at the future of coffee. So these are projections in terms of the challenge that climate change is, fa you know, that farmers are facing due to climate change, but also the challenge of demographic um, changes of people leaving agriculture and moving into cities. So who's going to farm? And where are they going to farm? Those are big questions, um, you know, for looking at supply of coffee in 50 years. And I, I certainly think I, I'm not uh, a, a, um, a doomsday uh, sayer, at least unreasonably. I want people to, first of all, I think it's Im immoral, frankly, to try to just to risk making young people so depressed that they don't want, I, I, I remember I grew up in the in the book the population bomb was growing oh, yeah, up, yeah. and, uh, and uh, I uh, know well uh, my generation uh, what uh, what the response was from some people who uh, you know d did almost the uh, social uh, equivalent of running out of the house when the War of the Worlds broadcast was on radio and with the uh, cloths over their mouths ready to, you know, to gasp their last oxygen. I, I think it should be uh, uh, hysterical responses, unwarranted, no matter what we're hearing because, frankly, one of the great capacities of the human being, and I t we talk a lot about sustainability at Coffee Con, so mm -hmm. I'm, I feel very obliged to add this whether it's a preamble or in this case the post preamble, um, is uh, is that we shouldn't necessarily uh, the the problems are always here in the planet and people work on the problems. That's part of what we do as human beings. We're always given new problems. Sure. I'm uh, I'm I'm very capable even in my own business, my own life of creating my own problems when I'm bored and don't have something better to do. <laughs> I'll create problems that I need to solve. It's a man's nature, human's nature to do this. Sure. So I'm I'm uh, I'm not at all uh, upset because this is happening. I just something that I I did have to ask about and I do think that sure. I do think coffee is um, important. Uh, certainly there are other problems that are the uh, global warming may have to do with it uh, beyond coffee, but I certainly, um, you know, li like to ask these things. And it's interesting how many good coffees there are oh, coming yeah. out now. Tremendous. There's a lot of great coffees coming out. Um, I've got to find a way to. Do it. What do I do with this, Michael? Can I pour it in here? And since you mentioned it, I'm um, proud to say I gave a sustainability lecture at Coffee Con. Yes, you did. Back in, I think it was the first one. One of our wasn't first. It, it yeah. was our first one, I believe. Was that the electricians? Yes, we were in the, in the right here in Warrenville. It was we a were cool in space. The, yeah, it is a cool space, and it, it uh, it's one of my favorite spaces here. Uh, and and there, uh, yeah, it is a cool space. And yes, we had that was uh, 20, 2012. Yeah, like January or February of twenty twelve. Yeah, Amazing, was, we get a nice day for it really good food trucks lots yeah, of people it was fun <laughs> okay so oh my gosh you, what is your overwhelming oh my gosh what wow aromatic and taste what do you think I can tell you I've never I've never 
smelled an aroma of a coffee like this is pleasant but it's yeah. different it's different are we you sure it's coffee huh? yeah right cinnamon it is. cinnamon is cinnamon yes. yeah did you put cinnamon here we all no. oh, come on this is a cinnamon <laughs> creamer is it no. <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 shockingly like cinnamon apple pastry wow. danish um, yeah, there's a there's like a there is like a, a sweet roll in it. That's what I was I was I was saying like a like a uh, 